Hi, and welcome to Dog Sports Decoded. My name is Megan Ritchie, and I am the host. Uh, today, I wanted to talk, touch on uh, what might end up being a very controversial topic, um, but what breed of dog you should look at if you're getting into sports. So uh, we'll see how well I can tackle this one. Um, but I, I wanted to address it, I guess, for a couple of reasons, because there's a few different ways of approaching this. So for most of you, I'm going to assume you already have a dog you would like to get into sports with. Um, so you're probably not running out to buy a new dog. And that's actually what I would recommend. <laughs> we don't want to go out and buy a dog um, unnecessarily. The dog you have at home can probably do most any sport you want to, to try and compete with, especially if you're just starting out. So uh, recommendation number one, don't go buy a new dog. <laughs> um, it can get very expensive to add new dogs to your household, um, but also if you're just beginning is likely not necessary. So uh, if that's you, you probably don't have to watch this video if you're interested. Um, maybe you're thinking of adding a second dog, you've gotten into a sport, um, you'd like to get a new dog, or you don't have a dog but you're interested in sports and you're kind of wondering what breeds you should look at, um, this is more going to be for you. So if you're looking to add a new dog, um, maybe you know what sport you want to get into and maybe you don't. Um, and so if you've been thinking about different breeds, and, uh, and what you'd like to get. Um, hopefully we can cover that today and maybe give you some pointers. So um, I would say I'm not a, an expert in this, but I'm gonna give you sort of my opinion as we go through. Um, so I'm just gonna flip you over here to uh, my very high tech PowerPoint. Um, and that, so that's what we're gonna talk about today, just which breed of dog should you be looking at? So uh, kind of the first point here I want to talk about is do you choose the breed or does the breed choose you? And um, I think this is kind of a, my thinking on this has changed quite a bit. Um, let's see here if I can, yeah, sorry, I was going to try and put my video here. I'll just, uh, maybe I'll do that. Um, my thinking on this has changed quite a bit over the years. Uh, when I first got um, my dogs, or Tess I'll say, uh, she's a curly coated retriever, I really thought like, oh, I went out, I did all this homework and I found the perfect breed for me, you know, so I thought, you know, as best as I could and, um, you know, so, so I went out and I kind of actively chose the right breed for me and made a smart decision, right? So that was sort of my initial um, thinking in that and that's how I would recommend anybody um, go out and choose a dog and I'd say my my thinking on that has changed quite a bit uh, really now I would say I'm more of the of the thought that really for whatever reason some breed is going to appeal to you or um, a breed group is going to appeal to you and so really you know pick what you like and that's maybe a funny funny thing to say given sort of the the title of of the podcast and sort of the topic at hand but I think, you know, at the end of the day, you like whatever breed you like for whatever reasons, you know, we seem to like them. And for whatever reason you're drawn to that breed, I'd say, you know, go with it and work with it as best you can. Um, I've got maybe a couple of exceptions to that rule um, at the end of the podcast that I'll talk about. And that's um, maybe breeds you should avoid if you are a first time dog owner or a first time sporting dog owner. Um, and that was certainly the case uh, case with me when I, I went uh, went through that process. So hopefully I can I can touch on that um, a little bit later. But uh, yeah, I'd say really my thinking has changed a lot. So it's it's kind of an odd odd thing to say given the topic. But um, I think for whatever reason, like if you're drawn to a husky, you know the most perfect dog for you and your family maybe is a cocker spaniel. But um, if you're driven to that husky for whatever you know intrinsic reason that you you like that breed um, you're probably going to go with that breed whether it's the right breed for you or not so I'd say you know if that's the case with you and you're really drawn to something just work with uh, work you know learn about that breed and kind of what their predispositions are and work within the problems and benefits that come with that breed because they all have them so uh, so that would be my recommendation just know what you're getting into and uh, and work as best you can to provide for the needs of that dog and that breed. All right, so that takes us to the next one. And uh, really quickly, I want to touch on purebreds versus mixes or rescues. Um, so I don't really have a dog in that fight, so to speak. Um, I've chosen for my own reasons to go with purebred uh, dogs. 
uh, gives me a little bit more consistency, I felt at the time, um, in the attributes I was looking for in a kind of a sporting partner. And um, so that's the route I went down. I, I wouldn't dissuade anyone from going through a rescue or a breed rescue if that's what you choose to do. Um, but kind of in the course of this podcast, I'm going to talk about breeds because even our rescue mixes or, or you know, mindfully bred sporting mixes, um, you know, they're still made up of whatever breeds went into them. Um, you know, that might be 10 breeds, it might be two breeds, uh, might be one breed if they're purebred, but, um, you know, whatever the reasoning is, there are breeds that, that have made up that mix. And so, you know, regardless if you know that history or not, you're working, you're going to end up working with some of those traits. So that's, that's kind of how I'm approaching this. So don't take it as, um, you know, me saying you need to buy a purebred dog or can't go the rescue route. Um, you know, for some families and lifestyles, if you can go the rescue route, that's great. If you can get an older dog, um, you know, that's gone through those puppy years and stuff like that, and maybe is a little bit quieter, that can be a great place to start with a sporting dog. So, um, don't think I'm trying to push you one way or the other in that purebred, um, versus rescue versus mix, you know, again, kind of, kind of go with your own gut and what feels right to you. Um, but I'm going to talk about breeds just because, um, you're going to be dealing with those traits, whether it's a mix or purebred. All right. So what are the most successful breeds, um, when it comes to sports? Uh, you know, I think that's important to address first of all, um, as sort of a main topic, uh, because if you're thinking you want to get into a certain sport, um, you're going to have an easier time, I'll say, if you are going with a breed that has already been proven to, to do well and succeed in that. So, um, again, I, I don't, I'll say there's kind of two, two schools of thought, and we'll get into that in a little bit here. Um, but you're either going to go into this knowing you want to do a particular sport, which is probably going to guide your breed choice, or, or your, I guess, three, three courses of action. You have a dog, and you're just going to, you ha want to do a particular sport, so you're going to make it work. Or, um, or you know you want to do something, but maybe you're not sure what you want to do yet. So it might be, might be you know, if you're more drawn to, say, that husky example I gave earlier, um, and you've chosen that husky breed, that might guide your sport choice, or maybe you've chosen a sport you want to do, say agility, and so that might guide your, your dog choice. But I'd say kind of either of those two are sort of the main, main focuses that we'll be talking about. And it's going to depend which way you go. So I'm going to talk more generally here, but in general from the sports I've seen, um, the most popular dogs and the most successful dogs and handlers are um, usually herding dogs. So you've got your Border Collies, um, Shelties, Australian Shepherd, Australian Kelpie. Um, they do very well. Jack Russells can do very well. And then into kind of fly ball and some of the other sports, you might see some mixes. So it might be Staffordshire Terrier mixes, Whippet mixes, uh, Jack Russell mixes, I guess. Um, but you'll start to see some of those breeds mixed together a little bit to get um, your particular things people are looking for. But it's in any of the sports I've competed in, um, you know, Border Collies are probably, Border Collies and Shelties are probably the top of the, um, you know, most popular, most successful. It kind of, again, in talking in generalities, so they're very versatile. You can play Frisbee with them or disc. Um, you can play agility. You can do scent work. You can do dock diving. Like, they're just very uh, fly ball, very, very versatile across the board. And um, so that's one way of approaching it. Uh, I would kind of issue a word of caution, and again, I'll get into this kind of at the end of the podcast, um, but you do still have to live with those dogs. So while they may be very, very successful in those sports and in a lot of sports, they're not always the easiest dogs to live with. If you're a first time handler, you're just getting into dog sports. Um, they're very, very smart, um, very active, very athletic. They need to be kept mentally busy. So you need to find a way to fulfill that need, um, you know, regardless of how you're feeling that day, they're going to need some outlet for that energy. So, you know, if you, maybe you've done 4-H as a child, you've done some handling, you've gotten out of, um, 
maybe animal ownership for a while and now as an adult you're starting to look into that again or, or you've kind of done raising your own kids and now you're kind of looking for a hobby to, to get into in retirement. Uh, you know, if you know what you're getting into, those dogs and breeds are great. Um, but I know for myself, I, just looking at the breeds and what their, their activity needs were, uh, you know, just how smart they were. They're very, very trainable, um, but you still have to find a way to keep them busy, like I said. So I know for myself, when I kind of got into um, the dog sports and was thinking about it, uh, I just, I knew that was way more dog than I could handle at the time. So don't feel like you need to get those breeds, but it's only fair for me to mention, um, you know, if you really would like to excel and exceed in those sports, um, you're going to have an easier time if you're going with a breed that has been proven to be successful at it. Um, so again, that's going to change on the sport you choose. Um, you know, if you want a you really want to get into um, herding competitions you're probably going to need a herding breed um, i'm not saying you couldn't teach your field bred labrador to do it uh, you know i generally think you can teach any dog to do it but certain sports are going to have restrictions against who can compete and uh, you know you're probably going to have a much easier time much faster um, process more success if you choose a breed that's suited to say herding where you know your field bred labrador is going to do really great in a hunt hunt test hunt trial environment you know again not saying your border collie couldn't learn to to retrieve for you um you know for personal hunting you probably could teach them anything you'd like to teach them um but you're not going to be able to compete with them so that's going to hold you back if uh, if that's what you choose to do um with hunt test or something right you can only hunt with uh you know specific hunting breeds for hunt tests so you know obviously choosing a breed that's for that is going to make your life easier and you're just going to find more success with it so so that's kind of how i would recommend approaching it um but again i want to talk about you know so what are the most successful breeds really depends on the sport um but again you see a lot of a lot of similarities kind of overarching all of that so as I said, quite a few of your herding breeds, your Border Collie, Australian Shepherd, Australian Kelpie, Sheltie, Jack Russell Terrier, um, we're seeing different Pit Bull type mixes, different Whippet type mixes, um, and then sort of your Belgian Malinois, German Shepherd are also going to be pretty successful in quite a few different sports. And then, you know, Retrievers, different Retriever breeds are also going to be successful depending on the sport as well. Um, I haven't seen as many compete sort of in the versatile space, but you might see them more on the obedient side and then, you know, again, in the breed specific hunting and stuff like that. So, uh, so that's important to keep in mind if you're looking to add a new partner, um, you know, it helps and you know, you want to get into a sport, it helps to get a breed that's going to help you, um, make that as easy as possible, especially if you're new to the sport. So how do you choose? Um, I've touched on this uh, a little bit already, um, and I kind of break this down into two different categories. So sort of lifestyle and sport. And uh, when it comes to lifestyle, again, I, I've touched on this, but um, it's really important to uh, you know, question and kind of prod yourself on what kind of life you live now, uh, maybe aspirationally what type of life you want to live, and ooh, wisely choose a dog um, using that kind of method um, you know if you have a toddler um, at home and you're very very busy and active with them you might want not want to add a super high energy um, Belgian Malinois or Jack Russell that's going to need a lot of attention or a herding breed maybe that's going to nip at your child so that's something you certainly want to consider when it comes to lifestyle um, you know, also just like what's what's your physical energy level on a day-to-day -day basis? Are you willing to take them out for an hour-long walk or run or bike ride every single day? So that's really important. Um, one thing that really struck with me when I was first getting into this, I was on my uh, the eventual breeder that I went to's website, and she kind of explained it in a, in the way that um, you know, no matter what I'll say, sport you choose to do with your dog at most that's probably only 10 percent of the time you're spending with them so if you want to do agility with your dog you're probably at most only doing an hour a day of agility with them so what are you doing with the other 23 hours of the day you know while you're sleeping you're maybe at work 
Um, you know, maybe they've got stuff going on around the house. They kind of follow you while you do your house chores and things like that. But really, at most, you're only doing that sport-specific training with them for an hour a day. So really keep that in mind when you choose the breed. So if you choose a really high-energy breed, um, maybe they're going to need more of a mental outlet. So it doesn't mean you have to be a marathon runner to keep them busy, but maybe you have to be willing to fill Kongs for them when you go to work and you need to you know tug with them when you come home or whatever but you need to give them some sort of positive outlet um, and then certainly the training time that they need but um, you know really consider what you're willing to do to keep them busy so um, I've kind of mentioned this but like Border Collies or Belgian Malinois incredible incredible dogs um, definitely not for the average owner definitely <laughs> I would, I would not recommend them for a, um, a first-time sporting dog owner. They're just a really high-energy dog. They're very smart, um, and, and I'll say even for myself, I felt, um, you know, I, I was very drawn to, like, the Border Collie dog. really liked them before I got into the Curlies, um, but they, they demand a lot of you as an owner, and not everybody's up for that, and I certainly felt I wasn't up for that. Um, so it's not to say eventually I couldn't get there, but... Um, you know, do you, are, can you handle a dog that just will not sit still? It's not to say you can't train them to do that, but there's just some of those more hyperactive dogs, like a min pin isn't very big, but they're kind of notorious for, you know, bouncing around and just being busy. So does that f suit your, your personality style? And I know for me that would drive me bonkers. So I'd much rather maybe say spend more time training, um, except that I'm not going to hit the pinnacle of that, um, say agility level. Or, or something like that and the trade-off is I've got dogs I can live with the rest of you know the rest of my life comfortably and I'm good with that um, you know if you really want to hit the pinnacle of that training level maybe you do need a higher and higher um, driven dog um, but maybe you don't need that right away like maybe that's your second or third dog um, but you know you, you ultimately have to decide that um, but I think lifestyle considerations are very important to uh, to consider so if you are thinking about it, just take that in mind. And then again, I've kind of touched on this sports side a little bit already. Um, but, you know, clearly if there was a particular sport you wanted to do and that was, you know, you knew you wanted to get into agility or, or something like that, you're going to have more success um, with, a, you know, a lighter, a lighter dog, let's say the Border Collie or the Sheltie, than you would with a Bulldog or a Mastiff, right? Just just kind of physics body mechanics um, you're gonna have an easier time um, so you know if you didn't think you could handle the border collie on the lifestyle side um, you know maybe a Australian Shepherd's a, you know a better second choice or or even you know you talk about um, you know field bred labs versus um, more confirmation bred labs or pet bred labs uh, you know, maybe that field bred lab is a little too much for you to handle even on say an agility side uh, We're not even talking about hunting, but if you wanted an agility partner a field bred lab is maybe more than you want to handle at home But maybe a you know a pet or a confirmation bred lab lines is going to be you know They're still going to be very competitive in agility. You're still going to learn all the things, but they're going to be a little easier to live with so um, I think that's an important consideration uh, when it comes to sport as well. Um, but you kind of end up bouncing back and forth between those two. So there's sort of that lifestyle component and the sport component. And you really need to figure out which one is more important to you and go from there. Um, so that kind of ties into this uh, last little component, which is which breeds should you avoid? And I've you know, it's not really fair to say, and I've talked about this already, um, but if you've never owned a dog before, I definitely would not recommend a, uh, a Border Collie or a um, Belgian Malinois, something like that, uh, even Jack Russell. They're just very, very busy breeds, um, and it's it's a lot to handle if you've never, never trained a dog before. Um, it's not to say you can't do it if you're not competitive, if you're not committed um, or if you are committed I think it's possible like certainly um, the curlies were were not recommended in anything I read for first-time dog owners and I did it and it's doable um, but it's a lot of work and uh, and if you're willing to commit to that um, just know what you're getting into so I think it's possible but 
um, you know, not the recommended route for most people, and uh, um, you know, just something to be aware of. So I thought I'd kind of flip over here to, um, if I can get in here, to the AKC website, and I really like their website um, for a lot of reasons. They just seem to do a very good job of, of keeping information um, in front of you. So I thought I'd walk through um, uh, the Belgian Malinois a little bit and just kind of show you why I wouldn't recommend them for a first time owner. We'll see here what we can pull up. Um, so again, they're incredible dogs. Uh, you know, it's amazing what they can do. And, uh, you know, there's clearly a reason they're chosen for police work and things like that. Um, but I kind of, I kind of wanted to show you the, um, uh, the energy requirements and things like that. So I really like this part of the AKC website. They give a lot of information here. Um, grooming can be an important consideration. Uh, you know, with this breed, uh, it talks about shedding a little bit. Um, but, you know, that this is going to be a fairly easy to care for coat. Um, shedding would be probably the only major consideration here. But for a different breed like a Poodle or even a, um, you know, Labradoodle, some of those breeds, there's going to be a lot more grooming involved, you know, Bernese Mountain Dog, something like that. A lot more grooming requirements. So if you're, uh, you kind of have to judge if you're comfortable and confident doing that yourself um, and can, can kind of live with that maintenance side. But I kind of want to show you the exercise component. So um, I kind of like here, they, they kind of will show you a bit of a range uh, of what each breed's exercise requirements are. And um, I don't know what, I haven't pre-read any of this, so I don't know what it says, but it kind of does talk about what they excel at as a breed. And often you'll see, um, yeah, often you'll see sort of a, an idea of how much exercise they need. So this one doesn't sort of mention a specific timeline. Um, we'll go through maybe a couple other examples, but I think it was the German short hair pointer I was looking at, and they they kind of specifically said in this exercise portion, like a one hour walk a day will not be enough. So um, you know sometimes this can give you a good idea of of what's required. And I know for myself even even though I was very active in sports when I just had tests, like at our peak we were probably in three or four training classes a week. So that's actually quite a bit. And I may, I would probably not recommend doing that, um, but I kind of got gung-ho into it. And, uh, um, but it, that's a, you know, for most of us, you know, if you really got into high level agility, you had multiple dogs, you might train three times a week and then go to a weekend trial. But for your average person just getting into sports, you're probably only doing agility once a week at your class, and then you know later on trialing once a month, something like that on the weekend. So like I said, you still have to figure out what you're doing with your dog those other six days of the week um, that you're not training or, or competing. So um, you know, if, if a one hour walk isn't enough, what are you going to do with them that isn't your agility class to keep them busy? So um, this one, they don't really talk about, you know, specific energy, um, but it does say, you know, daily walks are not enough. So uh, they do talk about that. I'm not sure what's under this training. Uh, it does talk about prey drive, um, can chase children, vehicles, animals. So again, you talk lifestyle components. Are they going to be good with cats? Are they going to be good with young children? Um, if you do have young children coming in, you know, you just had a baby, something like that, are you truly going to have the time requirements to commit that these guys really need? So one other thing I do really like, they do talk about trainability here, and uh, I think that's sort of an important component that I probably glossed over earlier, but if you are not sure what sport you want to get into, um, I really like looking for, you know, any of those keywords that say these breeds are very versatile. And that's what I love about my curlies and sort of Labradors and any of the retrievers. They're very trainable, generally. Um, the curlies aren't known to be as trainable as some of the other, other retrievers, but um, overall, they're still a very, very trainable breed, and they're very versatile. So, you know, if we try agility, we're probably going to do okay at that. We're probably going to do okay at fly ball. We're probably going to do okay dock diving and in various sports. So you know, whatever direction we choose to go, they can probably do it. And I'd say for a lot of those breeds, um, that's also very, very true. So I kind of mentioned already, you know, Border Collies, Australian Shepherds, Shelties, Jack Russells, they really excel 
uh, across the board and that's just a testament to how versatile they are. So if you aren't sure what specific sport you want to get into, um, looking for a breed that is very versatile is going to be helpful to you. Um, so that's that. Uh, maybe we'll go and see if we can find the um, Border Collie. Just see what they say here briefly. And uh, there's going to be quite a bit of, you know, uh, difference. Um, you know, this might be, say, the show standard. That might be different from, I'll say, maybe a working dog standard. So you will see some variety in there. So, you know, a comp confirmation um, border collie is probably going to have a nicer, longer coat, where a working border collie is probably going to have a very short coat because they don't want a bunch of poop caught up in it. Um, and things like that. So you might see some differences when it comes to grooming uh, as you consider those things. Uh, you know, the show, show dogs, confirmation dogs might be very different from the working dogs. Um, but again, I'm just going to jump over to exercise and see what they say. So again, they're talking about high drive, extremely athletic, daily exercise beyond walks. Um, so they do give you a pretty good idea of, of what it's like to live with them. And that's why I kind of focus so much on that lifestyle component. Uh, and again, kind of mentions all the different, you know, how versatile they are, just talking about all the different sports, and then the energy level. And maybe we'll try Australian Shepherds here really quickly. I'm not going to take you through a million of these, because you'll be interested in whatever breed you're interested in, as I kind of mentioned. So, um, you know, if you have a handful of breeds that you are considering or looking at, um, you know, it can be great to go through them specifically. But because these are such common and popular breeds um, in the kind of competition sporting world. I thought they'd be a good example. So again, higher energy, um, more exercise. Uh, it's talking about one or two hour daily runs. So you're getting kind of an idea of, of what it's like to live with them. You can see, you know, I wouldn't say this AKC um, ranking is perfect but it does give you an idea of energy level. So in comparison to the Border Collie, they're showing that the Australian Shepherd is a little bit less energy, which, you know, in kind of talking to other other owners and trainers, I would say is, is true. So in general, they're gonna be a little less driven and busy than a Border Collie, but they also showed the Belgian Malinois to be about this energy level, and I don't know that that is true. I can't say I've had enough personal experience with them, but um, I would say the Malinois is probably a, I don't know if they're more energetic, but they're more driven, I would say. So kind of watch out for your hands if you're tugging, um, playing sports where you're doing a lot of tugging, like say fly ball or agility, rewarding at the end of a, a, a run or a practice session, something like that. Um, you know, they're going to be more mouthy probably than, um, than some of the other breeds. So, so that's something to consider. Um, I might just pop over and show you the curlies. Um, again, they probably would not be my recommendation for a, a new owner, but that was one of the reasons I kind of would like to show it to you. Um, so they talk about um, a fair bit of exercise, but what really appealed to me is they do settle down and relax at home. So like I kind of talked about that min pin, they might not need a lot of exercise in in the sense of you know a two hour run every night but they're just very busy and active and if you're a very busy and active person or enjoy that in a dog you might love that it would drive me bonkers so um, i do like an active dog when we're working or out um, you know going for a hike or something like that but i like a dog that's a little quieter at home i'm in a small apartment so a dog that's bouncing off the walls would just drive me nuts so that's something that i like this exercise component um, I don't know what it, I don't see anything here, um, that talks about kind of how long you need to take them out for, um, but to me this is more of an average. They've got this as on the more energetic side, similar to that Australian Shepherd we just went through. Um, I would say, you know, yes outside in the field, not so much at home. So, um, again, this is just kind of a general guide, but I do like this, uh, this little, um, information that they've put together um, and then training 
uh, you can see here they're talking about obedience and then hunt training. Um, trainability here is lower, um, but I would say they're, they're very they're very trainable. Um, but you can see in comparison to that Malinois or the Border Collie or the Australian Shepherd, they're not kind of referencing as many sports. So you can start to see um, in some of these, you know, different breeds, you know, there's there's dogs that are going to be more versatile and more successful at more a, a higher level in those particular sporting events and then there's going to be dogs like the curlies that are a little more breed specific so again i do quite a few of the different sports with my curlies but we probably will never hit that same high level that some of those other breeds will hit and i'm okay with that um, but again if you're you're uber competitive you're probably going to want to look at a dog that's going to be more competitive across the board so um yeah so that's something i just wanted to touch on there um not sure what else we have over here uh so i've already kind of so what breeds you should avoid um you know again to me that would be if i was recommending to somebody that i knew did not have any prior um oh, sorry send you over to the video here so if I knew I was recommending this, say, to a coworker or something, somebody like that that had never done dog sports but they kind of had seen, you know, in Calgary we have a, a local horse, uh, well-known horse jumping facility called Spruce Meadows, and um, as one of the sort of side events, they have something called the Prairie Dogs. So they do sort of demo agility runs and kind of fly ball races. It's a little bit of a modified um, thing, but it gives people enough of an idea of what dogs are capable of and what sports are out there. We also have um, uh, the super dogs here in Canada, but there's a few different sort of traveling um, groups that sort of do these demos, and they might be a little bit of a mix of sort of stunt dog, trick dog, some agility, some fly ball, um, but they give people an idea of what's out there. So if I was talking to a coworker that maybe had seen one of those demos, I thought, oh, that looks really cool. I was thinking of getting a dog, and now I'm thinking I'd like to try that. Um, you know, if you're coming in and you have never done any dog training before, but you think you would like to, kind of aspirationally, I think, you know, a majority of the dogs that are easy to train, relatively easy to train, relatively um, athletic, you know, you're probably going to be a good place to start with those sports. Um, but I would not recommend... For anybody probably that they start with a border collie or um, a malinois or any of those super high energy super high drivey dogs that's a lot for anybody to live with um, and they're wonderful wonderful breeds in the hand of the right people um, but those are probably not good first time dogs for most people um, if you've had experience with them you know what you're getting into uh, you know that's one thing if you've just been away from the sports side for a while and coming back to it or if you, you know, maybe you have a friend that's really into it and you've kind of got into it. So you're looking to, uh, you know, keep working with your friend or, you know, you kind of, you know what you're walking into. And I think that's where it's, you know, it's quite sad to see dogs rehomed or, um, you know, just owners, you know, even if they don't give them up to, for adoption or something, it's not fair to you and it's not fair to your dog to struggle for the next 10 years of your life because there's this mismatch. So, you know, uh, an average you know, pet lab um, from kind of a more pet or confirmation side, they're going to be fine. They're going to have plenty of energy to do dog sledding if you want to. They could do agility. They could do fly ball. They could do, you know, pretty much the sky's the limit. Uh, they're a very versatile breed. Um, you know, they're generally friendly, which helps. And I haven't talked about that, and maybe I should. Um, but I'd say, you know, in general, they might not ever get you to that highest level of competition. But for a first dog, you might not even want that. Like, it's often that you, you know, be careful what you wish for. Um, Riggs even, you know, between my two dogs, I got Tess first. And she is a much more sensitive dog. Um, but she's also, um, I would say, quieter now. I don't know. It's hard for me to compare their energy levels as puppies. Tess was a bit of a wild child when she was younger too. But I'll say in agility, she's much slower, much more careful um, than Riggs is even at the same age. So, um, you know, energy wise, they might be the same if we're going for a walk or something at the, that age. But when it came to agility, Riggs is much more confident. He moves a lot faster. So it was way easier for me to learn with Tess. She gave me that time to learn where to put my body, 
um, where how to best guide her to the next obstacle. It gave me that time to get in front of her, do a front cross, and then send her where she needed to go. Where with rigs, I really have to be a lot quicker, um, so it helps that I have that previous experience with Tess. So I already kind of know, I'll say, the movements I need to do to get in position to do, say, a front cross. Um, you know, I'm not working on my own footwork, I just have to get there faster with him or, or really work on slowing him down in certain places so I can get in front of him. You know, where if I had started with um, even just a really quick moving, uh, there's a, you know, a friend has a, uh, an amazing little Boston Terrier, but man, that dog is fast. So how do you get in front of that um, if you're just figuring out your footwork yourself? Like that dog is going to be 10 miles ahead of you before you even thought of the next obstacle. So it is kind of that be careful what you wish for. So sometimes that higher drive, you know, they might be a more competitive dog, but it that might just make it 10 times harder to learn on. And that's okay if you're committed and, and willing to... Um, you know, do what's necessary to get there, but it can be really, really challenging and discouraging in a lot of ways if your dog is, you know, 10 steps ahead of you and you always feel like you're holding them back. So it might be easier to start with, say, that Australian Shepherd, and then your next dog is the Malinois or the Border Collie or, or what have you. But if, even if you can knock off, you know, a, a little bit of that energy and um, drive, you're still going to have a very, um, you know, athletic dog to work with but, um, you know, maybe not driven bonkers because your dog's always 10 steps ahead of you. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's one thing I want to talk about. Uh, so it's not on here, um, this, uh, but I just mentioned it, the friendliness. So I might flip us over to um, the AKC website again. Um, so that's one thing I was actually kind of shocked at. Um, I was doing a little bit of research after I'd got tests, but before I got rigs, I was looking at some different breeds and considering whether I wanted to get another curly or not. And uh, really looking at them, uh, I don't know, I should just search here. Let's say the top 2019 breeds. We'll see if we can pull this up. Doesn't have to be this year's exactly. But even just looking at the top 20 AKC bred or AKC breeds ranked just by popularity, um, it's kind of surprising how many are not particularly friendly, um, which is a real challenge when it gets into that reactivity. So if you're a first time dog owner and you have a breed that has a uh, predisposition to be a little wary of strangers, um, and then you're trying to take them into this you know, eventually the show environment where you've got a lot of dogs, you've got a lot of handlers, you've got spectators, you've got kids running around. Um, it can be a bit of a recipe for uh, disaster, and it certainly was for me with Tess. You know, I went through quite a bit of reactivity issues with her as a puppy, and that was a few different problems, I think, combined. Some of it was health, um, but a lot of it, looking back, I could have easily avoided. Um, you know, had I had the handling experience that I have now. So when I got rigs, it was so easy for me to see like, oh, this is where I, I fell short when I had tests. And, you know, I probably could have avoided 80% of that reactivity issue if I just knew like, okay, she has a predisposition um, to be a little wary of strangers because that's the, in sort of the breed, breed standard even kind of talks about that. Um, so it doesn't mean they're not friendly, but they're going to be a little more wary. They're not like your sort of stereotypical golden retriever or Labrador retriever that just loves everybody. Curlies are definitely on the more wary side. So, you know, once I'd gone through that with Tess, it was easy for me to see how to avoid it with Riggs as a puppy. So it was easy for me to say, like, okay, we see a stranger coming. We're just going to pull off to the side. I'm going to ask him to sit and give him some treats. So... Um, you know, I'm, I'm building that positive association of, oh, I see a tr stranger, I'm getting some treats. And just introducing that to him as a puppy makes it way easier when we go to the show pen, um, you know, later on, and there's a lot more commotion and stuff. Um, but uh, it really shocked me how many of these dogs just are not, um, not necessarily known for uh, um, being that friendly. So um, retrievers are, they've got labs here at the top, this was 2018. Um, I don't believe German Shepherds are, but we can we can look that up. Mm -hmm. 
used. Because a lot of these dogs, you know, if you have a herding dog, you know, some of them were more specifically for herding. I'll say like, um, like the Border Collie is, is actually, a, I'll say a true herding dog. Um, where others like the German Shepherd or um, even some of the more guardian dogs, yes, they herd, but they're also more on the protective side. Um, so we'll just see here. I believe they talk about, not sure, temperament here. So, you know, aloof, wary versus outgoing. Um, so you can see that one's kind of in the middle, which um, probably makes some sense. Um, and then we'll flip back to here maybe and just see. So I would, I'm just guessing here, but I'm guessing your bulldogs are going to be pretty, French bulldogs are going to be pretty friendly. Um, bulldogs are probably middle of the road, beagles. Uh, poodles. Um, I think the short-haired pointer is very friendly, um, but the wire hair I was looking at is not as friendly. So um, let's maybe just pull that up. So we have the short-haired pointer. This is one I was looking at. And if you don't want to go through the AKC website, sometimes I find books are easier. So I do have um, a book that I use and sort of any of the, if you find a dog dog breed book. Um, they're all going to kind of talk about temperament, um, so that'll tell you a little bit of how friendly or not friendly they are, and then versatility. Um, this AKC website's just very easy and has a lot of info. So you can see here, it's the German short-haired pointer, fairly friendly and outgoing, um, but if I show you the German wire hair, which I was looking at as well, Uh, I, they were not, I don't know what AKC will show, but in general they're not as um, friendly. I think that was under the training tab. So yeah, you can see the difference just between the German short hair and the German wire hair. So the German short hair was about here, where the wire hair is out here. So again, if this is your first dog, um, you're going to be dealing with, in both, the, say, the German short hair and wire hair case, um, very similar, very high energy dog. Um, they are a very trainable dog, I understand. Very versatile dog. They can do a lot of different, I'll say, sports. They can hunt. Um, so they're very versatile in that sense. But you can see just that temperamental change is a big difference. Um, so that's really all I wanted to show you. Um, and just uh, in general, so even even among a lot of these, they're, they're very popular breeds, but they're not, um, um, you know, like your Husky might be very popular, but, um, you know, are kind of known for, I don't want to say running away, but not having a great recall, I'll say. So that's not to say you can't teach a recall, but, um, you know, you're going to have a much easier time teaching a Husky to um, go dog sledding or canny cross or even weight pull than you are, say, maybe a sport that's going to require them to work really closely with you. But uh, on the friendliness side, um, I think that's something people maybe don't consider a whole lot. Um, and I don't know if you should or shouldn't really at the end of the day, kind of like I touched on, uh, you know, early on, uh, do you choose the breed or does the breed choose you? And, and more and more now, I kind of think the breed chooses you versus you you know, I think we all like to think like, oh, I did my research and came to this logical conclusion. And I think uh, that's less true than I used to. I think kind of more now we go, oh, I like this breed. And then we come up with all the logical reasons why afterwards. So, so that's what I would say. Um, you know, so when it comes to friendliness, that is something I would kind of consider um, if you're a first time sporting dog owner. Um, dealing with reactivity issues is not much fun, especially if you're trying to compete in a dog sport and you know that's somewhere you want to go. If you're, you know, you're starting at square one in that sport anyway, you're brand new to it, um, adding sort of reactivity issues is just going to make it that much more of a frustration for you. Um, and if they're a high energy dog, uh, you know, probably quadruple the frustration because now um, you're dealing with that frustration at your sport. Um, you're dealing with that wariness of people everywhere else you go, though. So if you're taking them for an hour-long run or walk, um, they need that outlet somewhere. So if you're taking them for a walk and all they do is see, you know, 
dogs and people and if they're upset by that and you haven't handled that properly as a puppy like I said like I didn't with Tess um, you know it just it's it breeds frustration in you I would say and so uh, you know if you're looking at two different dogs uh, that friendliness is something or sorry two different breeds or or two different dogs I guess if they're grown up and you're kind of going more the rescue route um, you know, whichever one is more confident, more friendly with strangers, you're going to have more success in that sporting environment. So uh, just really quickly, I'll flip over here and try and summarize as quick as I can. So I just spoke about this, but um, do you choose the breed or does the breed choose you? And more and more now, I'm thinking um, the breed chooses you for whatever uh, sort of intrinsic reason, you're probably going to be dr drawn to a specific breed or breed group. I know for me, I don't really know why, but I really like those hunting breeds. So if I was looking for a smaller dog, I'd probably look at an American Water Spaniel or a Cocker Spaniel, just because I like those breeds, before I would ever look at a Sheltie. And that's not to say a Sheltie's not a great dog. They do phenomenally, but for whatever reason, I am drawn to those hunting breeds. So I've got the Retrievers now. I was looking at the Pointers. Um, you know, I don't know if I'm not convinced there's any real rhyme or reason to it, but that's what I'm drawn to. So I'm going to say you're probably probably the same way uh, to some extent. You know, whatever breed you're, you're drawn to, you're probably just going to make that work as best you can. Um, and then again, the purebred versus the mix. I don't really care one way or another. I wouldn't recommend particularly one way or another. Um, in general, that purebred root is just going to give you a little bit more um, uh, confidence of what you're getting as far as um, inborn traits. So, you know, my retrievers are going to uh, be more, have a tendency to work closer to me. So they're going to range maybe within 200 meters, I'll say just naturally where you know a husky if I'm taking them off leash is naturally going to range a heck of a lot further um, where uh, you know a toy toy breed a companion breed is again probably going to stick a little closer to you so you know even just in that sense just knowing what breed they are what that breed tendency is is going to give you a little bit more confidence in what you're getting um, and whether it's going to fit either your life or that particular sport and then the mix side, um, I still think you need to know about the purebred side because those breeds are going into your mix. Um, but whether you buy purebred, whether you rescue, um, whether you get a puppy or an older dog, uh, you know, that's totally up to you. I don't really see uh, there being a, a big impact one way or another on your future kind of sporting career. You can have success with both. You can have troubles with both. Um, so kind of just go with your own sense of what's right for you in your situation there. Uh, what are the most successful breeds? Again, just kind of in general across the board, what I've seen um, do very, very well at higher levels in most of these sports. Border Collies, Australian Shepherd, Australian uh, Kelpie, um, Shetland Sheepdog, uh, Jack Russells, then some of the Whippet and kind of Pity Bulldog um, mixes as well. Um, so, so those are kind of what are succeeding Belgian Malinois at a high level. Um, some of those German Shepherds, um, that's what I see people having a lot of success with kind of across the board, across the various sports. Um, but it is kind of can be a little bit sport specific. So we talked about herding and uh, sort of field trials on the retriever side. So if you wanted to get into one of those particular sports, there's clearly going to be more successful breeds that are sport specific. But across the board, um, I do see the, kind of those those other kind of especially the herding breeds seem to be very successful in general across the board. Um, and then how do you choose your dog? I kind of mentioned lifestyle, so kind of gauge your own lifestyle and what you're, what you can live with and not live with. Again, sort of that 90% rule. You're living with the dog 90% of the time. You're training them 10% of the time. So you might have the most amazing dog to train or breed to train for that particular sport that you're interested in. But if you can't live with them the rest of the 90% of the time that they're just hanging around the house or, you know, you can't comfortably take them for a walk because they're just, they're pulling you around. Maybe you're a, 
you know, 90 pounds soaking wet and uh, your mal malamutes dragging you down the block, you know, maybe lifestyle wise when you're not doing your particular sport, that's maybe not the best mix. So I'd consider that kind of lifestyle part. Um, and then, you know, if you have a breed that you're looking at that's very high drive, which a lot of our sport dogs are, they're high energy. Um, you know, if they're a herding dog, they're likely to nip and try and herd. So if you, again, if you have really young kids around the house, that might not be the best choice. Uh, you might not want your, your border collie um, sporting dog, you know, nipping at your toddlers. They, they toddle around the house. So, so I would consider that when you're looking at your breeds. And then again, kind of sport specific, if there's a specific sport you get into, um, you might want to look and see what's, what's successful at that sport and also what's allowed. Um, so I kind of talked about that on the retriever side. Uh, but if you want to compete in sort of the retriever hunt tests, you need a breed that is allowed to compete in that. Um, so I couldn't compete in that with a Jack Russell Terrier. <laughs> so it gets not to say I couldn't train my Jack Russell Terrier to, uh, which I don't have, but in theory, if I had one, um, I could probably teach them to retrieve a fallen bird but um, and return it. They're very trainable, so I probably could teach that, but they're not going to be able to compete um, through the AKC or, or the hunt test because that's not an approved breed. So if there is a particular sport you want to go after, uh, I would obviously look at that, but if, if you're kind of looking more generally, you want a dog but you're not sure what to get into, um, I'd say you could look at kind of that more, more variety. It's going to open up more choices for you. Uh, so that's what I would look for. And then again, the breeds to avoid. Um, and that's more looking at lifestyle and sport. There's nothing wrong with any of these breeds. They are phenomenal. And it's a bit of an inverse problem. So often the most successful dogs at it, uh, they're very successful because they're um, easy to train. They're, you know, very driven, whether that's toy driven, food driven, or um, uh, just intrinsically driven, I guess. Um, like your border collie is just going to self-reward if they're actually herding. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of those breeds are, you know, the, the positives with them are also the negatives with them. So all the things that make them wonderful also make them not uh, an easy choice to live with um, for your average first-time sporting dog owner. So if you have a really high-drive um, border collie to compete in agility with, uh, you're going to have a lot of success in the agility field, but that might not be the easiest dog for you to live with at home that, that other 90% of the time. So that's where I, I, it's kind of sad to see, as I mentioned, like Malinois re, trying to be rehomed or Border Collies returned or, or at rescue just because they are innately so busy and, and want to work. They just have such a hard work drive, uh, work ethic, um, that you really need an outlet for them. So I would I would tend to, if you're a first time sport owner, I would tend to encourage you to avoid those breeds or at least those um, super high energy working dog lines. So again, if you wanted a field lab, uh, you know, field lab versus a pet lab. Well, if you're a first time dog owner, that pet lab is gonna be a whole lot easier to learn agility with than a field bred lab would be. So. Um, even just taking that into consideration, um, it's not that there's anything wrong with those breeds. I'm not saying that at all, um, but they can be, you know, when you start to talk about lifestyle and, and just the fact that you're learning a new sport, they can be very difficult to work with. I kind of mentioned the example of, of tests versus rigs and agility and just tests just being that little bit less driven, a little bit slower gave me the time and confidence to get better, which then meant the next dog could be a little bit more driven. So that's kind of how I would approach it. Um, I hope that's helpful. Um, you know, the breed issue is so hard and and there's, there's so many different opinions. So I'm sure some of you uh, watching this are gonna go, oh, that's, you know, terrible advice. I would recommend this. And, and that's okay. And I really think that comes back to, um, to some extent that breed choice, like, we're just dr drawn to one thing or another. So um, I would never say, you know, if you have your heart set on a Malinois, then go ahead and get the Malinois, but know what you're getting into. Um, and it's not to say if you're, you know, you might hit all the factors that say like, maybe you have a young toddler at home, maybe you work full time. And, you know, in any normal sense, that would be a very difficult um, lifestyle to have the Malinois with. But if you're super dedicated, and you wanna do protection sports or something like that, 
um, and you're willing to do that training and your lifestyle does allow it, um, you know, you've got the family support or maybe the whole family's interested in that sport. So it's kind of a big family affair. You know, you all go with your parents. Maybe your parents watch your toddler while you compete. Um, you know, that's totally, totally doable uh, with the right commitment. But for your average person, um, I would not recommend that right off the hop. So that's kind of where I say which breeds to avoid. It's definitely nothing against those breeds. Um, often it's the opposite problem. They're, they're too good at it. <laughs> more than anything. So uh, it's a lot for a new owner to handle. But yeah, that's what I wanted to cover today. So I hope you found that helpful. Um, and I'd really just, you know, if you are in that position where you're looking to add a new dog or a second dog, and you're thinking about getting into a new sport, I really like that AKC website. Some of those things I walked you through, um, looking at the temperament, looking at the trainability, looking at the energy level. Um, that's a, you know, a free and very easy, accessible resource to look at. So I'd recommend you check that out. Um, I've also got two or three books just on dog breeds. Um, kind of the most popular, I think it's like the top 200 dog breeds and mine are, are probably quite out of date now, but most every book I've seen um, that kind of goes through the dog breeds like that, um, they've got very similar rating systems. So uh, one of the books I have, I think is, is ranked you know, up to five stars or something like that. So it'll talk about temperament, it'll talk about friendliness with strangers, energy level, same same sort of idea as that AKC website. And just show you, say, so say five stars is, you know, extremely high energy, one star is low energy. So any of those sort of similar resources, if you are looking at that next dog, I'd, I'd look at either of those two. So something like that AKC website, or, um, or one of those dog breed books and, and just look for those keywords if you are looking for a sporting breed. And uh, you know, if it is more, more general sports you're looking at getting into, I wouldn't shy away from an average energy type breed for your first sporting dog. Um, you might not hit those super high levels of competition, but um, it's gonna be a little bit more livable dog with you, a little bit easier for you to start. And then it kind of, as I mentioned, the friendlier they have a tendency to be, um, probably the easier it'll be for you to get started in that show pen environment as well. So just food for thought, I guess, but um, check out that AKC website or, uh, or those breed books and just do your homework and make sure you can live with, uh, you know, Whatever breed you do choose, whatever dog you do choose, um, you know, you're going to have to live with each other for the next kind of 8 to 14 years. So, so do the best you can to do your homework and um, just make sure that uh, the lifestyle is going to fit, be a good fit for both of you for the next 10 to 14 years because it would uh, uh, be a terrible feeling to, you know, bring a new dog into your life that you're very excited about and then two or three years in, you're just looking at yourself going, goodness, what did I get myself into? Like... Um, you know, I don't want to rehome. There's such a stigma around that. You know, I don't want to rehome the dog, but I'm not happy. They're not getting what they need, and it's just this mismatch. So, um, hopefully, this helps you avoid that. And uh, go check out those those couple resources I mentioned. So, thanks for joining me, and I'll talk to you guys uh, at our next podcast. Mm -hmm.